the presence of everyone here tonight uh, for this Wednesday night uh, devotional period. I would like to ask you, are you a sentient being? And if you're not sure about that, just pinch yourself. And if you feel it, then, then you're a sentient being. Well, it, I would say it's obvious to any reasonably sentient, sentient person that there's much division in the religious world today. We can all see that. And this division exists in all the major religions, even though they may proclaim unity. Let's just restrict our consideration to Christianity only. That is, uh, those religion, religions that recognize Jesus in some capacity. And we, we know there are hundreds, if not thousands, of distinct doctrines encompassed within that term and embraced by a like number of denominations, all proclaiming that their distinct doctrine has the sanction of God. Now, logically, that simply can't be. If this were not so, then anyone could create a doctrine out of thin air, and Jesus would be obligated to sanction it. If man can logically do that, then Jesus has no doctrine uniquely his own. If so, then he has never had a doctrine his own. He had to wait till a man conceived of a doctrine, the tenets of which were of no concern to Jesus, and then Jesus had to sanction it. Consequently, consequently such an uh, illusion has provided a reality today of thousands of doctrines that are all false. If it is not the doctrine of Christ revealed on the pages of a rightly divided New Testament, then it is false. A man-created doctrine is false. Now, I, I don't doubt that those uh, embracing uh, such unauthorized, unsanctioned doctrines uh, believe that such are approved of God, but it just cannot be so. As one preacher of old said regarding these man-made doctrines, memorialized in creeds, disciplines, or whatever name they are called, no matter how well crafted, if they contain more than the New Testament, they contain too much. If they contain less than the New Testament, they can contain too little. And if they contain only the New Testament, then they are not needed. And I'd say that's a pretty wise observation. All this approach to scriptural authority prevailed for hundreds of years, at least uh, until the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th. Uh, at that time, there were those who questioned how salvation could logically be promised by radically different doctrines. Furthermore, these individuals wondered whether these denominations could be unified in their doctrine, and if so, on what basis? Perhaps, just perhaps, all could just go back to the Bible as a source of unity. After all, most denominations acknowledge the Bible as the Word of God. If there were some other source document that all could accept and coalesce around, these individuals were at a loss to name it. <clears throat> it was in this context that the phrase, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent, originated in the early 19th century during the so-called American Restoration Movement, which was a, a religious movement aimed at uniting Christians by returning to the New Testament as the only standard for doctrine and practice. The slogan was popularized by leaders such as uh, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, Martin W. Stone, and others, who sought to move away from denominational doctrines and creeds and embrace a Bible-only centered faith. Now, the principle behind this uh, phrase reflected their belief that Christian unity could be achieved by relying solely on what was stated in Scripture, properly executed, of course, and avoiding interpretations or doctrines not directly supported by a rightly divided biblical text. 
So why could uh, why could not people profession to be Christian uh, Christians speak as the oracles of God? That was something they wondered, and they had a hard time getting there, but they didn't get there. We are here tonight uh, by the grace of God. Therefore, by his grace, I propose to teach the first principles of the oracles of God, Hebrews 5.13. And to speak only as the oracles authorized me to speak, Colossians 3.17. Now, I have no doubt that we, like the Jews of old, are committed to keeping the oracles of God, Romans 3, 2. That being the case, let's not fail in our responsibilities. What I would like to first cons consider for the remainder of this lesson is this. Is water baptism of a penitent believer into the Christ essential to one's salvation? That is, is baptism obligatory. In answering this question, we must address two questions. First, are we required to follow the commandments of the Lord? Secondly, is baptism a command? Now, there are other aspects of baptism that we'll consider, but if it is, if it is no command, the other aspects are interesting but not relevant to salvation. Of course, in this short lesson, I, I can't cover everything about baptism and other things necessary to salvation, but I'll, I'll do what I can. <clears throat> so let's read in First Chronicles 28, verse 8. You might just want to write these down and then look them up at your leisure. So First Chronicles 28, verse 8. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God, be careful to seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it as an inheritance for your children after you forever. The be careful is the same as keeping. And I think a better translation in this uh, particular uh, uh, verse is the, is the King James Version. And it reads like this. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and so forth. In Psalms, the 119th Psalms, verse 4, it's written there that you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. And further, in the, again, in the 119th Psalm, verses 33 through 34, Teach, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I'll sh I shall observe it with my whole heart. This idea of commandment keeping is found throughout the Bible. My Bible. I'll just give you just a few examples. In Deuteronomy, <clears throat> a number of places there, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, it reads there, but showing mercy to thousands, those who love me and keep my commandments. And on down in chapter 7, verse 9, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And down in the 10th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 12 through 13, and now, Israel, what does your Lord, your God, require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. And looking in the New Testament in John 14, chapter verse 15, it says there, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> And on down in the 21st verse, he who has my commandments and keep them, keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved uh, by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, I could go on and on, but, you know, I think you get the idea. <clears throat> if the Lord's commandments are important, <clears throat> and they are, uh, many would say that it is difficult to know the commandments. 
they would say that we can never really know the truth. We just can only approach it. Truth has always just seemed to be a, a step ahead of us. Regardless of what uh, some may think about learning the truth of the Bible, Paul says it is not impossible. In addressing those gathered at the area Areopagus in Athens, Mars Hill, Paul said, among other things, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And he says, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repeat. You can read the, the rest of that next. 17 chapter verses 22 to 31. It's recorded in the first chapter, uh, first book of, uh, or first John, chapter three, verse, uh, chapter five, verse three, that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. God is truth. His word is truth, John 17, verse 17. His word, where we uh, learn of God, the Christ, and the means to salvation is not far from us, therefore he is not far from us. Furthermore, his commandments are not burdensome either in the learning, the comprehension, the comprehension or the keeping. So let's look at that uh, passage in First Chronicles 28, uh, chapter verse 8 again. Keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. And of course, there's a blessing and a, and a curse if, if you don't, or do or don't. Now, the words uh, keep and seek are in the Hebrew language imperatives. In this instance, direct commands. In the Hebrew imperative direct command, the speaker gives a forceful instruction or command that demands immediate specific action on the part of the addressee. The Israelites were instructed to seek, uh, seek and keep the commandments of the Lord. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 17, we read, uh, said, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter li into life, and we're talking about salvation, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. In this verse, keep is in the Greek imperative mood. The subject of the verb keep is the hymn. He said to him, the subject him must do what the verb says. And the thing the subject must do is the object, commandments. This means that the commandments, that's the object of the verb keep, must be done by him the subject of the verb keep. The verb keep, uh, is, as used elsewhere, is not always in the imperative mood. For example, the passage we uh, just read in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep here is a written verb, but it's in the indicative mood, in the so-called first class. It assumes a reality for the sake of argument. If you really love me, then you will keep my commandments. Of course, the counter to this uh, is if you don't keep my commandments, then you don't love me. <clears throat> In John, the 15th chapter, verse 10, it says there, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Keep is a Greek verb in the subjunctive mood, which is, expresses a contingency. If you do that, that is, keep my commandments, then the consequence is this, abide in my love. So the importance of a commandment keeping cannot be overstressed. If we determine something is a commandment, then we are obligated to keep it since it has all sorts of positive effects if we do and negative effects if we don't. This has always been the case. Respecting the uh, Garden of Eden, that's a place of perfection in which there was no sin, no decay. There, it was uh, written in, in uh, Genesis, 
the following. The Lord planted, Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he, who he, whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's Genesis second uh, ch uh, chapter, verses eight through nine. And on down in the 15th the verse of that same chapter, the, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. It was at this juncture God issued the very first commandment and the only commandment in the garden, unless, of course, one considers the tending and keeping to be commandments. Regardless, commandments were minimal. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, Adam and he violated that one commandment and suffered expulsion from Eden and were burdened with all the incumbent effects of such disobedience, such as death and decay. We read in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter of the episode of the cleansing of the Syrian commander Naaman. He was described as a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. A young captive Israelite girl suggested to Naaman that he see the prophet Elisha and that Elisha could heal him of his leprosy. But when Naaman stood at the door of Elisha's house, Elisha had the temerity to send a servant up to the great and honorable Naaman. The servant conveyed Elisha, uh, Elisha's command to him, that is Naaman, to wash seven times in the river Jordan. Naaman was just, uh, he was just furious. Now, after some conjoling, he did wash seven times in the river Jordan. He was cleansed of his leprosy, but only after the seventh washing, uh, washing, which tells us that partial commandment keeping is no commandment keeping at all. Many other oh, uh, Old Testament examples could be given to stress the importance of uh, commandment keeping. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we read that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Also in 1 Peter 4 and 5, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And further, in Galatians 6, chapter verse 7 and 8, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to this flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. This all says that actions, especially in obligatory matters, have consequences. Also, failure to act on obligatory matters has consequences. Now, you may be thinking, I thought this was about uh, baptism. It is, but I first wanted to have it firmly ensconced in your mind that to be pleasing to God, we must be commandment keepers. If scripture establishes an action to be obligatory, then we, and we desire salvation, some may not, it's incumbent on us to complete that obligation, to be obedient to that obligation. Therefore, let us consider uh, first John 3rd chapter verses 1 through 21. I'm not going to read all that. You can read it on your own. In a conversation recorded here, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus made a statement to Jesus. No doubt he, he expected some reply. And regardless of his motive in approaching Jesus, Jesus made it an unexpected statement to him. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that threw, of course, Nicodemus off. And I doubt that it's a reply that he expected. But it was a reply that Nicodemus needed to hear. 
Now, he replied to that, but whether his reply to this simply a simple declarative statement was made in honesty or mockery, I don't know. But anyway, Jesus again answered in a most unexpected way. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh and born of the spirit is spirit, the spirit. And he goes on to say, to, you know, don't marvel that you must be born again. Wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. Uh, but cannot tell where it's come from, where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. <clears throat> so all this says is that Jesus was not talking about a physical born again birth, but a spiritual born again birth. This born again birth must be a water and the spirit. He was not talking about two births, but one birth with two elements. If either element is missing, then there is no born again event. Without this born again event, there is no possibility of entering the kingdom of God. There can be no doubt that water refers to water baptism, but water baptism alone will not gain one entry into the kingdom of God. No one can enter the kingdom of God without having his past or alien sins forgiven. And we, we talk about the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is uh, in the church of the same. Now, that, that's a whole separate study. We can't address that here. But if you want to kind of do some research on it, look at um, Mark uh, chapter verse 1, Acts 1 verse 8, Acts 2 verse 1 through 4, and maybe other places as well. But anyway, Jesus... Uh, is the same one in this passage that said in another passage, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned, Mark 16, 16. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, we read, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, <clears throat> and everyone who loves him will be begot also, uh, who but God also loves him who is begotten of him. To be born of God here is to be born of the Spirit in John 3, verse 5. Thus must mean the same thing. The second and third verses following uh, this uh, verse 1, of course, says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. <clears throat> For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Since th things equal to the same thing are equal to each other, it necessarily follows that the born of water and the spirit occurs when the penitent believer obeys the gospel, that is, keeps the commandments. There are denominational scholars who admit that the allusion to water in John 3 verse 5 refers to baptism. But in the erudite ignorance, they qualify it uh, in some fashion to mitigate the obvious, obvious necessity to be baptized to enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Since the gospel, the, the very words of the gospel, are the sword of the spirit, all the words of the spirit must be obeyed to enter the kingdom of God. Consequently, baptism must be performed, but it does not work alone. <clears throat> The passage in Titus 3, verse 5, further confirms that baptism is essential to salvation. It reads uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Uh, I'm not going to read the first uh, four verses. But the fifth verse says, not by work of righteousness. And he goes on to say, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So we're saved according to his mercy. How? Through the washing of our generation and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we are saved by being born of water and the Spirit, or I said here, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In establishing that the kingdom of God and the church are the same entity, it should be noted that after the coming to pass of the things noted in uh, Mark 9, verse 1, Acts 1, verse 8, and Acts 2, uh, verses uh, 1 through 4, and the conversion of the 3,000 in Jerusalem, that's in Acts 2. 
the kingdom and the church are spoken of as in existence. But the question you need to ask is how did the 3,000, I mean, there are more there than just 3,000, but how did the 3,000 get, in, get into the kingdom, the church, the abode of the saved? How did they get there? When those who were gathered in Jerusalem heard the first recorded uh, gospel sermon preached by the apostle Peter, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2 verse 37. They believe the message that uh, Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Their pitiable plea indicated their repentance of their sins. But they didn't know what to do to rid themselves from the guilt of their sins. Peter gave them the answers they so desperately desired and needed. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 38. As we have hopefully established in your minds that an obligatory thing, that is a commandment, must be obeyed to enjoy the blessings attendant upon such obedience and avoid the punishment visited upon the disobedient, some may view this passage as a mere suggestion. To rebut that, the question uh, to be here asked is and answered is the word repent a command? And is there the phrase, let everyone you be baptized, is that a command? To answer that, uh, let's, uh, let's look at the Greek. As a side note, you know, we understand that the subject of the verb, verb repeat, you know, we need, need to know your subject and your object. The subject of the verb repeat is your, while you are, your, those gathered to hear Peter's sermon. And by extension, all who subsequently hear his sermon, which includes those listening tonight. The second verb, be baptized, names the subject, every one of you. Are you included in the every one of you? Well, certainly you are. Now, putting this side note aside, the English word repent is a Greek, Greek verb in the second person, aorist tense, active voice, imperative mood. The second person indicates that the person spoken to is the actor. The heiress, the actor means one who must act. The heiress tense considers the action from beginning to end as a whole, as a completed whole. Active voice signifies that the subject of the verb must perform the uh, action described by the verb. The imperative mood signifies that the verb is a simple, straightforward command, something that must be done. Therefore, to enter the kingdom of God, must one must repent of his or her sins. Now, the phrase be baptized, the baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo. It's also a Greek verb in the aorist tense and the imperative mood. But unlike the word, unlike the word repent, it is in the passive voice. The passive voice signifies that the subject is to receive the action of the verb. Repent is something that one must do. Be baptized is something that must be done to you. Both, however, are in the imperative mood, which to state again means that it is obligatory. Therefore, salvation cannot be obtained without repenting and being baptized. It should be noted that the end result of repenting and being baptized is remission of sin. Now I ask you, here one of our audience here, don't you want that? As I have stated, baptism acting alone is insufficient to wash away one's sins. There is no magic in the water. Belief, or just another word for faith, is required, Mark 16, 16 as is repentance, Acts 2.38, and also 2 Corinthians 7, chapter, verse 9 through 10. But how can uh, one believe what he has not heard? Romans 10, chapter, verse 17 says that faith, that is belief, 
comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's our source document. It is obvious then that one must hear the gospel and one must repent, that is, turn from his sins. It's ludicrous to believe that one could say that I repent of my sin, but I want to go on living as I always have. Repentance then is essential to salvation. As was the case for the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8, verse 37, confessing that Jesus is the Son of God is also required. Romans 10, verse 10. So there you have it in a nutshell. One must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of his sins, confess Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized. Then, and only then, can one walk in newness of life, Romans 6, verse 4. So I ask you the same question that Ananias asked Paul. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, verse 16. So that's the conclusion of my uh, little lesson here, and I certainly appreciate your kind attention to them. I, I hope it's helped. Thank you.